Even though that looks like it's the text, the Lord blessed the message out of uh, Hebrews 4. So when, when we get to Hebrews 4, it's halfway through the message. That's the one I'm going to keep coming back to, to refer to. That's really the core passage the Lord blessed the message out of. But I couldn't help but put 2 Corinthians 4 as a, like a scripture reading in the beginning because there's so many sweet words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> The uh, title this morning is To Labor to Rest, which uh, to, to labor to rest sounds a little awkward, uh, but it's to press on God, to press yourself to know whether you know that you know Christ savingly. And uh, the rest part is, is easily understood uh, by even the youngest here. That uh, it's, Isn't it great to wake up in the morning with a full night's rest? Uh, it doesn't seem like you get a whole lot of those um, as you have a busy work schedule and more children and there's less sleep but there's this, some of those days you wake up and you're like can't believe it I'm completely rested and you stretch and you feel refreshed you know your body healed overnight and you just feel new again this is a small glimpse as to what it is to rest on Christ to wake up spiritually resting on Christ is to be convinced that your conscience is clear that you're anew that you've got peace that, that Christ paid the debt of sin and torment and punishment, that, that you don't have to endure that, that it's over with, that Christ paid that, and that you have love for Christ more than yourself, more than your selfish self. You're sick of your selfish self. And Christ is the love of your life now. This is what it is to wake up resting on Christ. And that's the... The love affair I have for each buddy, everybody here at Grace Bible Church is that you rest on the true Messiah. You, you rest on the true Christ. That's what I want for everybody here. Let's, let's read the text of 2 Corinthians 4. I, I started in verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Ourselves, we're just your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have these treasure, this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. For we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore I've spoken. We also believe, therefore speak, knowing that he which raises, raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound or give credit to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man renewed day by day, renewing. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more ex exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So the introduction to this message is this eternal vision, this eternal focus that a believer has. That's where it's at. To look to Christ, to rest on Christ. Turn back to five, verse 5. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord. This is the one that you can't see physically right now. But spiritually, if you ever see him, you'll know it because you'll rest on his work alone to recommend you before the Father. His work alone for salvation is, is what you see. His work is what you see. 
spiritually, you see his death, burial, and resurrection was for you personally. And you see a rest on Christ, or you see and you rely on Christ. To see Christ is to believe on him and to rest on him and to trust in his confidence that he's able to save those that he laid down his life for. And you've got that same trust and confidence in his blood that Christ had to buy you back. <clears throat> but man, lost man, and before I was saved, I was a first front row sinner, wants our own actions to play a part. Lost man would rather use sin and deceit that Satan delivered to us through the fall as our means of salvation. That's how lost and doomed and blind we are before conversion, before salvation. We think that our works can recommend us before God. That's physical stuff that we can see. It, I just read it. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Why would you look to the works of your own hands? That's not eternal. That perishes like your body. Like I just wrote this precious passage here about our bodies just fading away and dying off. But every day we're renewed spiritually in Christ that he died for me, that he recommended me to the Father, that I'm safe and secure inside him in heaven right now. That's to be renewed mentally and eternally in Christ. So, but lost man, the deceitfulness of sin is alluring, appealing, delightful to the lost soul because it gives a short time of a conscience that's persuaded is I'm okay. But then that conscience comes back in, I'm not okay. So you got to do something else physical that you can see, that you can put your own hands on, your own eyes on, say, see, I'm religious, I'm righteous, I'm holy before. That's all going <clears> to <throat> perish. <clears throat> I don't know. You think about all the churches right now that are preaching a message. They're actually preaching sin as a means of justification right now. False churches are preaching man's works are a means to justify yourself. And by God's grace and mercy here, we're saying, what you do declares you're in hell right now. If you think that your work makes you right before God, you're lost in your sin and you haven't been pulled out of the pit of hell yet by God Almighty's power. You're yet in your sin. You're, you've fallen in Adam and you're still in the pit. Turn to Hebrews 3, please, to see the deceitfulness of sin. I want to warn everybody here, run from sin. Hebrews chapter 3, <clears throat> how deceitful sin is, is alarming. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, while it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Moses was grieved 40 years. God was grieved 40 years with those that came out. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. There's no rest for those that die out of their life trusting in the works of their own flesh. There's no rest for them. There's no deliverance for them, and there's no peace in this lifetime, and especially not throughout eternity, because they're working out their own salvation with their own sense of morality, their own sense of personal best effort, and they are in utter denial of Christ's righteousness. The God, the Father, only accept Christ's work for there to be another merit out there somewhere that you rest on, other than Christ, the true Christ's righteousness, that's to deceive yourself and to be in the throes of death and to not even know it, to be proud and arrogant that you can save yourself and that, that there's something that you have to require of your own hand to prove that you're a religious person. That's to be no, not faithful, to rest on your own works. Turn to Matthew 16, please. Matthew chapter 16, 
example of the religious people in Jesus' day when he was on this earth during his earthly ministry. These Pharisees approached Christ in Matthew 16, verse 1, with the Sadducees, and they came tempting, desiring him that he would show them a sign from heaven. They, they wanted a religious experience that they could say, see, I've seen something religious that I can put my hope and trust and confidence in. Christ gave them no peace. He answered and said unto them, When it is, it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. What Christ is teaching here is that if you wanted a religious experience to prove that you're safe, that's not authentic. That's not the real God. Don't look for one. Look to Christ. Jonah was a picture of the Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection is what Jonah went through in the belly of the fish. And then he went into that great city of Nineveh and he preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because that's what he went through in the fish's belly. He had to be reminded of the basic common denominator of true faith is to rest on Christ's work for him. So that's what he went into the city preaching, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's all that you need to look to. A physical sign in this life, a, a, a funny ceremony, something to do tricky that makes you look like you're a good person, that's foolishness. Don't look for it. That's the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is so crazy that you think that you don't need God to save yourself. It's so insane that you can have your own peace outside the peace and love of God. In Adam, we all fell to the state, blind, ignorant of God, full of sin and sin ruling our, in our hearts. So much that we believe that rebellion against God's word yields us righteousness. That's what Satan sold that day that he went down to Eve and said, hey, if you rebel against God, you'll be okay. Surely you won't die. Satan promised life to sin, and it yielded death. Satan promised to have power of your own destiny. That's what Satan promised. No, you'll know good and evil. That's what he promised. It yielded no ability to even see that you're doomed. Amen. It yielded nothing. The fall ushered in blindness. Death and spiritual blindness is all the fall ushered in. And Jonah, he said, they can't even discern their right hand from their left hand. Well, of course they could physically. He meant spiritually. You show them one thing right out of God's word, they don't even get it. They turn it back into a work that they got to do to justify themselves before God. God's word declares not to look to the law, but to look to the one that kept the law, Christ himself. But the fall delivered us all into this destitute state of worshiping ourselves and loving ourselves above God Almighty and thinking we can contribute to salvation. Turn to Isaiah 44. I love Isaiah 44, but it's the clearest place to show how pathetic idolatry is, how plain idolatry is. Past generations built little idols. You go to museums, it's fun to go to a museum, but all of them have these little idols in them, don't they? Go around the corner, there's another cabinet full of these little idols. They made them so small, you can hardly even see the images engraven into them sometimes. Others, they're so big, they have to put them in the auditorium part of the museum because they reach the sky. They're all idols made out of things that you can see and touch and feel. That's idolatry. Isaiah 44, verse 14, He heweth down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees and forests, and planteth an ash. And rain doth nourish it. This is a, a good thing to do on the earth. Plant trees. Fortify the forest with trees and nourish them. Then shall it be for a man to burn, and he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, kindleth it. Good thing to build a fire with, right? And bake bread. That's a good thing to do with wood. But then he makes a god out of it. Isn't that insane? And worships it. Actually relies on that piece of wood to justify yourself. He maketh a graven image and falleth down there too. Look at verse 17. And the residue thereof he maketh a God, even as a graven image. He falleth down unto it and worship it, prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me if thou art my God. See how foolishness idolatry is? To a piece of wood that it's going to do anything to justify you? They have not known nor understood. 
For he has shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. None considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire, I have baked bread upon it with coals, I have roasted flesh, I eat that flesh, and I'm going to make the residue of an abomination, and I shall fall down to the stock of a tree. Nobody is born with this rationale to be able to see what idolatry is. We're blind to it. So blind, verse 20, he feedeth on ashes and deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Your idol in your right hand, you look directly at it, you trust it as your confidence and your hope before God and you don't see it's false. You see it as good and righteous and you actually rely on an idol that's plain to a believer. It's foolishness, it's wickedness, it's ungodly. It's your own works. By God's grace, see <clears throat> that it can't deliver your soul. The, the things you see in your lifetime, and the things you act out in your lifetime can never deliver your soul. Satan wants you to believe that. He wants you to believe that you're in control of your destiny and you can do something to make a difference. You can change your heart. You can change your life. That's a lie. God's word says you can't deliver your own soul. And that piece of wood can do nothing. It's the same thing. You and that piece of wood are the same. Dead in sin and unable to enlighten yourself. What's the hope? Christ, the true Messiah, is the only hope for fallen man. And he has to come to where you're at. The lost state that you're in, that's where God has to come. And he does. He comes to where you're at and he shows you Christ died for you. Christ was buried for you and he was resurrected for you. He shows that to his people. He shows that the works of your hands are nothing, and then you drop that idol. You finally see it for what it is. You, you see it as the plague. It's the declaration that you hate God. All those things you used to rest on and rely on, you get rid of them immediately because you see them as foolishness. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4 now, please. And this is the the text passage, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we'll be uh, going back to. So put a bookmarker here, please. So we first point was to establish that, that lost man, all we can do is sin. All we do is rest and rely on false works to justify us before God. That's all we can do. Hebrews 4. Verse 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of in entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So there's some that hear this precious and pure gospel that Christ's righteousness alone saves, and it isn't mixed inside them at the same time that they should rest on that work of Christ. They hear about the work of Christ, but they don't consider it better than their own idol. They think their own merit, their own idol has credence above Christ. Somehow or some way, they've got a purer way than Christ himself. And they will not yield. They're not given by God Almighty to see the lie in their right hand. And they go on with that pride and arrogance of their own false sense of security as the means of their salvation. Verse 3 now, For we which have believed, we enter into that rest. We're given by God's grace to enter into that rest. You can't do it on your own. That's mercy of God. We enter into the rest. As he said, I have sworn it in my wrath. If they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place, of the seventh day on this wise, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in that this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of their unbelief, because they love their idol more than Christ. They love themselves more than Christ. It, it says it in the last verse of seven, they harden their hearts. Now jump down to verse nine. There remaineth, however, a rest to the people of God. The elect of God, we've been given to rest in Christ. For he that has entered into Christ's rest, he's also ceased from his own works. Those works of idolatry, you throw them away, you chuck them. 
as God did from his work. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. If, if you're full of unbelief, you'll never love Christ more. You'll never yield to Christ as the lone merit before God the Father. You'll have something in and of yourself, something you can look at, and you can dearly behold that's far more spectacular than Christ's work. And that's what you're going to rest on until your dying day, and it'll be revealed in torments that it wasn't good enough. And I don't want that for anybody here. I want everybody to come to the saving awareness to rest on the finished work of Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection is where it's at. Look at verse 6. There's no choice in this matter. Seeing, therefore, it remaineth that some must enter in. Salvation isn't a choice of man. Salvation is the choice of God. There's some that must enter in. It's because we're dead in sin is why it's a must. We can't, if it was up to us, it'd be a maybe. And there's no maybe to salvation. It's a must. God must save his people from their sins, and he did it. And we must enter in. The elect enter in. It says in Romans 11, 7, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Blinded by what? fall of Adam, the allurement of sin, thinking you've got something more powerful and better and more precious than Christ. That's what we're blinded with. Until God shine his light on you and give you a new heart, new ears, and new eyes to see Christ, you're blind in your own sin. Turn to Romans 9, please. Romans 9 is the best place to take somebody that has never heard the gospel to give them a sense of wherewithal of God's choice is salvation. God alone chooses who he will because this is the clearest place. These children weren't even born yet. God declared to the mother who would be saved and who would be lost. Romans 9 verse 11, For the children not being yet born, neither having done any good or evil of themselves, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, that's Sarah, the mother, that the elder shall serve the younger. What's God mean? It's written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Esau will rely on physical things to justify himself before God and perish in his sin. Jacob, however, will be arrested and intervened by God Almighty to rest on the work of Christ alone. He's going to look to the heavens for a Savior. Esau is going to look to the earth for his Savior. Esau is going to die in his sin, self-deceived, enamored with his own physical strength and his hunting skills and all the things that give him pleasure before God. All that's going to perish with himself, in his body, in hell, throughout eternity. And Jacob's going to be let scot-free. Even though Jacob, guilty of deceit and all the heinous crimes that he committed, he's going to find out Christ paid all that debt for me. And that all that's been swept away in the blood of Christ, in the love of God Almighty. That he sent his son to die in my place. And there's nothing I did to deserve it. I'm just the recipient of love and salvation through Christ's blood. This is what Jacob went through in his lifetime. Authentic conversion to rest and to look to Christ alone for salvation. Nothing physical in this life. Spiritual salvation, authentic salvation conducted by Christ on the cross of Calvary that washed Jacob's sin away. <clears throat> Turn to John 10 next, please. Jacob, like all believers, was shepherded into salvation by Christ himself. John 10, verse 14, is where Christ says, I'm the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I, the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. What, what a sure salvation. Jacob, back in the day when he found out that Christ died for him, he found out the same thing that you and I find out now. Sure salvation. Christ saying, these are red letter words in my Bible. Christ said these out of his own mouth during his earthly ministry, and they captured him and wrote him in this word, and, and they're red. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep, a particular people. This is sure salvation. This isn't a maybe. He lays down his life for the sheep. Look at 23. Jesus walked in the temple of Solomon's porch. Verse 24. Then came the Jews around about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. They wanted something physical to rely on. 
They didn't want to rest on the blood and righteousness of Christ. They wanted their own religious experience. And Jesus answered and said, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. You believe not because you're not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Anything you think, do, or say in your lifetime cannot pluck you out of the hand of Christ if you're in him. Does that give you a license to go out and sin willfully? You're a fool and you know not God if that gives you a license to do what you want. Out of love for Christ, we're obedient to his word. Out of a love for Christ, his substitutionary work for us, and we're going to sin heinously against him and desire to, we're going to be corrected in any sin we do and yield to him exclusively and consider ourselves trash and he's the only treasure in our life. That's what we're going to do by God's grace because, verse 26, I'm sorry, 27, the sheep hear my voice. Verse 27, the sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. The sheep are correctable. When we sin heinously, we're correctable by God Almighty. When we're caught in sin as the first conversion, we realize we drop our idols and we love Christ more than those idols. Right away, we are shown what the foolishness of sin is and our own guilt before God. And we have nothing to do with it at that point in time. But this eternal love that God has for us says that we'll never perish and that man cannot pluck us out of God's hand. God put us in his hand. How can man take us out? Man can do nothing to put ourselves into God's hand, and man can do nothing to pluck ourselves out of God's hand. It's God's will that we're saved, and it's his work that saves us. On behalf of his people, it's his son's work that saved us. Now turn to uh, back to Hebrews, to, back to our text, our subtext. Hebrews in chapter 4. <laughs> I want to come back to verse 2. <clears throat> Those of us that are believers see verse 2 as precious. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. There's some that come and hear this gospel. And at the time of hearing, it's not mixed in their mind to rest. And they'll not rest on Christ because they aren't given to rest on Christ. During the spoken word, only those that are elect of God the Father, loved of God the Father, Verse 3, are given to believe and enter into rest. We're given to believe. It's a free gift of God to believe and to rely on Christ. And then we start resting. In that process of resting, you can't knock us away from that. It's our hope and our confidence. You cannot swerve us from this. There's the only means of salvation and confidence before God is Christ. And we're convinced of it. We're sure of it. It's not an emotion. It's a convincing of the intellect. There's no other way. Where am I going to go other than to Christ? He's the single source of salvation. Please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 next. First Thessalonians, <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 2, <clears throat> but I meant to say Romans 10. Hold your hand in First Thessalonians chapter 2 and flip to Romans 10 first. I skipped a passage. Romans chapter 10 is about believing and the process God takes his people through to come to saving awareness of believing. Romans chapter 10 verse 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth, on him shall, shall not be ashamed. On him, any Jesus? No, the Jesus that died for a particular people and is resurrected and ascended into heaven right now with the Father. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. It doesn't matter what your background is in your life. For the same Lord is over all, is rich unto all that call upon him. You ever call on this God for salvation? You can't until he makes you believe. It says in verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? You have to believe. You have to be given God-given faith to rest and rely on Christ before you'll ever call for salvation. 
And how shall they believe on him and who they've not heard? You have to hear a gospel message. It's not just any message. It's about the true Messiah. And how shall they hear without a preacher? The preacher has to know God savingly also. If he's a fool, you'll never receive light out of a fool. And how shall they preach except they be sent? They have to be sent by God. Is it not written how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bringeth glad tidings of good things. That's because Christ directs everything that you say, do, and think when you're speaking the gospel. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah the Lord said, Lord, who believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Here's where faith and hearing are mixed together. Verse 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's got to be authentic spoken word about the true Christ. And that's where God gives faith to believe or rest on Christ's work. His death, burial, and resurrection is your means of salvation. Now I'll turn to 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2. And verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. Here it is. The spoken word from a saint's perspective is that wasn't the preacher that delivered that message to me. An angel from God Almighty sat down next to me. The Lord himself sat down next to me and gave me ears to hear, eyes to see, and an inner conscience that's convinced I'm safe in the work of Christ. It's personal and effective to those that are resting. It says here, right, right here in verse 13. So this gift of God to believe and to rest is delivered through the spoken word of the true Christ. And it's about the seventh day rest, isn't it? Turn back to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. This rest for the people of God is in verse 10. For he that has entered into his rest, that's Christ's work. He's also ceased from his own works. You no more rest or rely on your own idolatry. It's, it's, this is godly to rest on Christ's work. God rests on Christ's work. And when you're given to rest on Christ's work, that's the first godly thing you've ever been given to do. It's something man cannot conjure up. It's a gift of God that you're resting there. And that's a godly thing. That you've, that's the first godly thing and the only godly thing you'll do right when you're born new. You say, I'm resting on Christ's righteousness. So verse 11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Labor. Press. If you don't know whether you're safe in Christ, then you're not. God doesn't keep secrets from his people. Over and over, I've shown you passages that he loves his sheep. He shows his sheep. They hear my voice. And I'm going to reveal through the spoken word of Christ that you're safe and secure. If you don't have this, then you don't have it. Be honest. Be honest with yourself and God, and by God's grace, call on God Almighty. By God's grace, call on God Almighty that he give you a new inner conscience to rest on Christ's work for you. Turn to John 16, lastly, please. John chapter 16 and verse 27. May it, may it be the Lord just bless you out of this passage. John 16, 27. For the Father himself loves you. He, he loves you. God the Father, God that predestined all things to be the way they are, loves you. Because ye have loved me. This is Christ writing this. If you, if you love Christ more than yourself, more than your false idols, more than anything in this world, You've been given that love for Christ. It's because God the Father loved you first. And have believed that I came out from God. Here's, here's where the rest starts coming in. Anybody that believes Christ came from God, you're already rested. You need to just be aware of it. You, nobody can authentically believe that Christ came from God the Father unless you've been given to believe. This is the belief that starts calling from the believer's mouth. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Verse 28, I came forth from the Father, I've come into the world, and I leave the world and go to the Father. This is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This is where you rest your conscience. Oh, may it be that God give you to rest on this verse 28. The use of the message this morning is right in the bottom of your text. John 17, 23, I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, 
and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and has loved them as thou hast loved me. The love of God the Father is reflected in you loving Christ more than your sin and your idolatry. And when you're made aware of that, you're safe. You've got a new heart. Your inner consciousness is already resting on Christ's righteousness. And the elect are made perfect in Christ in this process. The elect are given to see that Christ is Son of the Father. This is authentic belief. And the elect are given to love the Father and love the Son more than anything in their life. And they're loved through eternity in the work of Christ. So labor to rest, everybody. By God's grace, labor to enter into this authentic rest to know that you're safe in Christ's work. I just bless the Lord for this message and ask that he use it to multiply the church.